outnumbered over time. Oh, Chief Baby, oh, can we have this conversation on line? I, I would okay, love to. Okay, let's talk about it. Yeah. Because what Ebony and I were talking about is kind of how we ended outnumbered over time, the TV version of us. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that um, the person that you're dating right now feels kind of disconnected because sure. he doesn't have a cultural connection. Yes. Yeah, so he's a, he's a white American man from New Orleans. Uh, to, to the extent he has culture, it's that New Orleans thing, that NOLA thing's over Can he cook? Thing. He actually can. He oh, just I got like a smoker. Yeah. He did some brisket over the weekend, and he won his law firm's cookie bake-off challenge. Anyway, oh, all right. I was thinking etouffee, but anyway, go on. About him. Um, but no, when we talk about, you know, cultural and identity and what legacies and things like that we would pass on if we were to, you know, have a family together, it's something he expressed to me, and I'd never heard it articulated like this, but he's, he's not Jewish, he's not, you know, of notable Italian or any other kind of rich cultural distinction that you might think of. And he says, I don't feel like I have culture. Um, and mm. I was like, wow. So, you know, much of the class we were discussing in the last block seemed absurd in a way. But for me, it didn't seem that far fetched. I would not run away from a discussion around the cultural of whiteness, whiteness in America and whiteness in the world. So not um, demonizing Megan, it by any stretch. you were leading yeah. this block on was it the University of Colorado at Denver right? Yes. Yes. that had the, the problem with whiteness course that mm -hmm. you could take for the diversity part of your curriculum. Like mm -hmm. you get three credits, three course credits from it. And so that was the context of this conversation. And I just thought what you were saying was fascinating. I mean, I, I guess I just sort of assume that everybody's got some sort of touchstone. You and I grew up military, mm -hmm. um, and you did too. So yeah. I've, I've always kind of felt like I'm part of that family. Mm -hmm. I'm also black. I'm, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of different things, so I don't really... I think that's important, though, Harris, is because you have the, the and first of all, I want to say I think we use the word privilege way too narrowly. It's a privilege. Yeah, because my get, husband's white, and he yeah. says he can't figure out where the privilege is coming. Yeah. Like, well, I know like I'm, I'm black, and I have a lot of privilege. <laughs> and, you know, it sounds like what you're describing here is to have all these opportunities for connectedness uh, in, in the way you see yourself. And by, that's, a, that's, a, that's a blessing. I also think we get blessing. too caught up with privilege yeah. and don't bring in socioeconomic factors. And that's to a huge that privilege. Mm. More than anything, of course that's privilege. Race. Oh. Of course Obviously, Jaden Smith is going to have a different experience than someone growing up in the inner city of Chicago. I can yeah. with so. my hair, though. <laughs> Everyone has privileges and disadvantages, and you shouldn't have to feel guilty about all the privileges Absolutely you have. Absolutely not. That's, or, a, that's yeah. a great point. The problem with classes like that, and you do so much campus reform, is that I think it stifles communication and discussions. Absolutely. Because people feel guilty and like, oh, I can't talk about it because I'm already guys, the have problem. Have you taken one of these classes, one of these kind of culturally diverse classes? I, I've, I've sat in on uh, different, you know. Did you? Because mm -mm. I, I, I had some really rich conversations. What did you experience? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I, I I went to some of the more radical camps and gatherings, which is like a now affiliated group, and it was kind of it. It, it was with the with the pronouns. You're supposed to ask everybody their pronouns every couple minutes because they could change. It was it was, and if you went, you know, item by item, you're like, uh, nobody's right or nobody's wrong. There's no disagreement, you know, no disagreements. Listen to everybody, and then there was like, but these things are wrong. It comes it get, comes to a point where you're trying so hard to be politically correct that you're no longer making sense. Uh, you can have the uh, discussion, but when you get to the point where it's hard to have a discussion because you're so afraid right. of somebody being offended or not even knowing how you might offend somebody, that's when it becomes a problem. And she writes really interesting pieces for National Review. And I mean, you did one, I remember, where people were offended that sushi was sushi, even... Sushi, because it was bad sushi. So it was cultural appropriation because it wasn't the way that, you know, sushi's made in Japan. It was just cafeteria sushi. Cafeteria food's generally bad food. They said this cultural appropriation its an insult. Hmm. So, you know, it's like, no, it's just bad cafeteria food. <laughs> Maybe it's generational. I don't know. Back in my day, I was in school in the early 2000s. We, I got to tell you, Megan, I had some of the most rich and vibrant, respectful moments of, you know, learning and disagreement well, and something? everything. I yeah. have given... I mean, I can't even begin to count how many speeches on college campuses. Mm -hmm. I now take the Jerry Seinfeld approach. I won't do it anymore. I, went, I had a very, I had a very negative experience at Reed College where they, I was, I told the people afterward, I don't know why you even invite conservatives because right. clearly they aren't even open to right. hearing it. The student body was very reactive and wow. very. Uh, I, I mean, I don't need to go into too much detail, but it was a very, very uncomfortable experience for me. And I have found, much like Jerry Seinfeld, many other comedians that. I don't feel connected as being a millennial in the sense that I'm not offended by everything. Right. And I, I went to Columbia. Oh, I listened to nothing but leftist yeah. liberal stuff my entire college career, and I didn't have a meltdown, and I'm still okay. Oh, sorry that but I don't. That's, that's okay. Sucks. I just I had okay. too many experiences on college campuses over and over again. And I told my speaking agent, I was like, it's just life is not too short it. for this. And it's interesting that so many comedians and other public speakers have kind of been like, it's just they're just too easily offended, and they don't want to have a discussion. So what are these people going to be like in the real world where there are no safe spaces? 
friends and people yeah. that they can bully off the stage and they can only hear the opinions that marry theirs. And they're going to have trouble unless they, unless they work in certain places in Manhattan or San Francisco or whatever. Or in but, their own house. Yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's true, too. Yeah. You know, on Thursday, uh, uh, I forgot which stop it was uh, during the thank you tour, uh, Donald Trump talked about making patriotism. You know, bringing back patriotism, and and that kind of brings back the question of assimilation versus acculturation, right? Uh, and and can people keep the identity of who they were mm -hmm. as immigrants when they came here, but also immerse themselves into uh, being a, what an American, particularly a patriotic American, hmm. versus assimilation, which it sounds like has happened to your boyfriend, perhaps over a, a long stretch of generations. You know, I don't know how long their family has been here. Sure. Maybe they lost that. But yeah. in New York, you know, Italians are proud to be Italians. Right. Irish are proud to be Ita Irish. Puerto Ricans are proud to be Puerto Ricans. Absolutely. I mean, that, it's something I think permeates in New York. But you have a lot of places where it's a big question. And also it's a big question, of course, for our policies when people come to this country now. To what extent do we do? Because even a lot of folks don't realize the Pledge of Allegiance was designed to, have, to help the, the last tranche of kids who came here from, from Europe, mm. particularly the Italians. They brought in, the, they, they believed in the political, politicalization of anarchism. So we had to make them pledge allegiance to the flag every single day of this country. The Pledge of Allegiance was altered several times, ultimately to make sure that people were citizens of Americans first, mm -hmm. and then perhaps you keep your culture, your cooking, yep. some customs, some things like the, yeah. your, your weddings. An overarching part of that was um, a monotheistic belief in God, which is why it's where it is on our money and in the Pledge sure. of Allegiance I mean, and so on sure. and so forth. Um, so Trouble 2K, I wonder if that's his real name, <laughs> on the live chat writes, so Fox is still going with the war on education, I see. It's interesting, because whenever we talk about this issue, no, 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 and I, I'm liking comments that I want to get into the conversation, because I think it's important important to, to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, it Actually, I don't feel like we're going against education with our discussion, although we had different differing points of view. But as a mom with kids in elementary school, I just want them to be exposed to everything. Yeah. Like, I don't want you know kids in the class based on their race or religion or anything else to be separated from my kids to learn about privilege and all of that because in a way that's just backdooring segregation. Mm -hmm. I guess that's how I feel. So to Trouble 2K, I, I'm not at war with education. I'm in love with education. Sure. I just want it all to, to be all inclusive. Mm -hmm. And are we not sitting on this couch having a conversation? And thank you of, for your comment, by the way. It was a great one, but of four different perspectives on this and we're coming at it from our different vantage points. I think yeah. I think that's the beauty of it to me. It's why one of the reasons I love working here, you know, is, is the diversity of thought and experience and perspective that we each bring. And to the point of assimilation, Charles, I was in Israel uh, last week and uh, we spent time, time with Ethiopian Jews, many of whom had come mm -hmm. to this, had come to Israel uh, like in 84, 85. Well, I remember. Uh, sure. And, and so they're now, <clears throat> many of them my age, uh, early 30s. And they were talking about how difficult that process was for them because they wanted more than anything in the world to be Israeli citizens and for that mm -hmm. to be their first choice of identity. They were proud Jewish Israelis, but they were also Ethiopian. And so maintaining that sense of cultural identity, it's, it's what Du Bois calls, uh, you know, dual, uh, duality, you know, and, and it's, right. it's, it's challenging. But I think that's that's the sweet spot. So when they were in their camps in Ethiopia and they were waiting to be taken someplace else. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Israel was one of their choices and would have been their first choice as they were yeah. keeping Judaism uh, inside their homes. What's interesting is the first Ethiopian Miss Israel was, I think, 2013. And when you talk with her and hear her story about mm -hmm. the things that they were doing in those camps to make sure that their culture stayed with them, the conversations they were having, it's really, it, it's delicious. And I would imagine it was what was happening on the ships on their way to Ellis Island. It's, you know, keep this part of us sacred. It's what happened you know, well, we know where it was happening. To get very micro macro on this, it's important to me. We had Julie Rajinsky on the show right off mm -hmm. the election, and she said, I fully admit I live in a bubble. So many of us in the media do. And I was like, Al contraire. I go home to Arizona <laughs> as much as possible. I, sh I shoot guns. <laughs> I drink beer. Do you and I have talked about this because you're from mm -hmm. Detroit? Right. And I think it's important to also stay connected to your roots and where you're from, yes. especially if you're going to be analysts on television because it's yes. obviously influencing your yeah, perspective. Or, or go out and volunteer somewhere, take a trip. Yeah. There's so many opportunities. If, if you don't do anything, to, and you'll stay in the bubble but if you know it's up to you if you go out there if you do go home stay in touch with your family your friends from other places from home then it's, it's up to you to actively mm -hmm. look outside the bubble i like this tom poolin says it is actually a privilege to be an american 
Of course Amen. it is. That's everybody. Of course, of course it is. I love our viewers. Oh, yeah. I really do, and somebody, I love the fact that they get on the live chat. Somebody tweeted all of the ladies on the couch today a giant bouquet of roses pictures oh. saying, oh. roses for the ladies. And I was like, well, isn't that I'll give you one. What about me? You got your roses. You got your roses. You got your roses. You like my little booty? Yeah. My wife hand makes those. That's so beautiful. You're kidding. Yeah, she makes them. Stunning. Wow. Yeah. You have a lot of love on the live chat. Thank Good. And Thank I'm going to quote a guy here. He loves the way you do the numbers. Oh. In the afternoon, you That's called good. it twenty thousand by the end of the week. That's we'll right. See it That's happen. right. We're making some money. This is a Trump elaborate. rally. He's going to keep going. All right, Ebony, thanks for being here. <laughs> Kat, thanks for being here. All right, we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. tomorrow.